and uh, of we are now. Um, my name is Tim Pearson. I'm secretary for the Harvard Club of Alaska and I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this month's presentation, uh, May 4th, on by Gunnar Knapp, uh, Dr. Gunnar Knapp, uh, on reflections on Alaska's fundamental fiscal choices. Uh, Dr. Knapp is Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Alaska Anchorage, the Institute of Social and Economic, Economic Research, where he was on faculty since receiving his PhD in economics from Yale in 1981 until his retire retirement in 19, uh, 2016. He served as director of ICER from 2014 to 2016. And during his 35 year career with ICER, he conducted a wide variety of research on Alaska's economy and resources, particularly markets for seafood, management of fisheries resources, and also taught UAA courses on the economy of Alaska and econ economics of fish. Um, in the years following with the collapse of oil prices in 2014, he gave dozens of presentations to organizations across Alaska. And uh, since his retirement, he's continued to study and give presentation on fisheries issues as well as Alaska's fish fiscal issues, which you can find on his website at uh, www.connornap.com. He also has personal interests in cross-country skiing and biking, music, writing, and travel. And he served as co-chair of his Yale class of 1975-45th reunion, uh, which was canceled in 2020 and canceled again in 2021. And at some point in time, I dare say, <laughs> they have hopes of pulling it off. Uh, so let me uh, go to the share screen and uh, uh, I will let him uh, prompt me through uh, the... Uh, the, the slideshow and uh, uh, Dr. Knapp, it's all yours. Welcome. Hey, uh, thanks very much for the invitation to uh, talk today. And it's, uh, it's great to see uh, so many uh, old friends and extremely knowledgeable people and uh, a little bit intimidating. Um, I, I, <laughs> but um, uh, nevertheless, I will press ahead. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'd like to start by uh, remembering an old Yale friend and member of our club, um, uh, Bob Mitchell, whose obituary uh, appeared in the paper just recently. He uh, um, was my fellow singer in many different organizations, um, and he was also a very loyal Yale alumnus. Um, so, um, uh, uh, in memory of Bob. Uh, continuing on. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a message on my backup computer. I hope that won't happen. Um, all states, including Alaska, and interrelated fiscal choices, services, capital investments, and payments to citizens, and how much to add to or draw from savings. Next slide, please. Um, now, Alaska's fiscal choices um, differ significantly from other states because of two fundamental factors. First of all, um, what you might consider a negative factor, we are a high cost state. It's, it costs a lot to run our state government, partly because we have a vast area, um, uh, land area with greater uh, resource management responsibilities. And in general, uh, almost every kind of cost is higher. Offsetting that um, and also making us very different from other states is our um, huge resource wealth. And to very briefly uh, you know, summarize where we've been and where we're going, uh, we started off as a state uh, burdened by our high costs and relatively low incomes, and we were in a financially precarious system. Then we gained vast resource wealth. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that resource wealth has uh, declined uh, dramatically, offset somewhat by uh, what we've saved. Um, and now we're faced to how are we going to um, uh, manage our original problem of being a high cost state. In put it simply, we have more needs, but we're richer, but we're not as rich as we used to be. 
Next slide. Um, now, the nature and consequences of Alaska's fiscal choices have changed drastically over time. Um, uh, and uh, two major factors contributing to this change have been the huge North Slope oil revenues um, and their subsequent decline, and then the growth of the Alaska Permanent Fund and its earnings. Next slide. Uh, a basic point that I uh, think would want to make and would emphasize anywhere is that choices that made sense when oil revenues were high may no longer make sense or even be possible. We can no longer sustainably simultaneously afford current levels of state services, uh, almost no broad-based taxes, and large annual dividends. Next slide. Let's see. Sorry, it's locking up. Okay. Next slide. Are you able to do that? I'm trying. <laughs> Four. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Next slide. Okay. So, uh, therefore, we face uh, very difficult fiscal choices between some combination of spending less for state services, paying broad based taxes reducing dividends or drawing down our savings. And our uh, fiscal choices will have Im important implications for our economy and society now and in the future. Next slide. So uh, my goal uh, today is to reflect on these choices and their implications. So I wanna <laughs> lower your expectations. Um, almost everything that, that can be said on this subject has already been said eloquently for a long time by many people, including many of the people listening to this call. Um, there's nothing that I know or can say that uh, many of you don't know better or could say better. Um, so I don't, I don't really have any brilliant new insights. Um, but what I hope to do is enjoy the rare luxury of an informed uh, and intelligent audience to offer uh, a longer term perspective on our fiscal situations than we're used to um, without having to start at the beginning with sort of the elementary stuff, which needs, which is typically the case when you talk about our fiscal situation. And I wanna hope to raise some questions and promote discussion. Next slide. So uh, a brief outline, um, uh, basically I wanna give you a very brief theoretical framework. As an economist, I can't, I can't resist the temptation to uh, make a little model to help me think through how to think about things. Um, and then I want to, and this is the bulk of the presentation, I want to take a look back at our fiscal circumstances and choices since statehood. And what do they say about the choices we faced and the decisions we made? And then I want to end with some reflections. Next slide. So uh, next slide. Uh, this brief theoretical framework um, the first two points is simply um, fundamental accounting applies. Um, any state uh, has to pay for what it spends. Um, and so uh, what it spends is its government agency spending and its capital spending transfers to local government and transfers to individuals. Um, and uh, that has to be paid for by its total revenues, which can include taxes, resource revenues, and investment earnings. Um, it can also be paid by net draws from funds and by net borrowing. Um, now, uh, what makes Alaska different, fundamentally different from most other states, is the things that I've um, outlined in red. Um, the fact that um, our spending includes very large transfers to individuals, by, by which I mean dividends, uh, very large resource revenues that most states don't have, very large investment earnings that most states don't have, and uh, very significant uh, uh, draws from funds at times and deposits into funds that other uh, states simply don't have because other states aren't in the business of, of um, creating permanent funds. Um, a second uh, fundamental reality is that current choices affect future options. Um, uh, in, in what you might call a normal state without these um, special circumstances, basically you pay as you go. You, you, you have taxes to meet your um, uh, regular government spending needs and um, you're, you're not as much facing 
the the kind of inner inner intergenerational choices um, that we face in Alaska. Um, our capital spending affects our future maintenance obligations. Our net draws from funds uh, affects our future investment earnings and net borrowing affects future debt repayment. Next slide. Okay, now here's the very simple model that um, I have to do. You know, when you get a PhD in economics, you have to sort of sign a kind of oath that you won't give an economic presentation without showing a little model and graphs just to torture people who find these difficult. But um, uh, let's, let's consider a very simple model of fiscal choices um, uh, in, in a world where that's not complicated by um, savings. And let's imagine a state, first of all, with no resource income. So all government must be funded by taxes, okay? Then um, the potential combinations uh, uh, of basically there's a, a direct trade-off between private consumption and government services. Um, and, uh, you know, you could use all your private income for private consumption, or you could give it all to government and have only government services, or you could have some mix. Next slide. Okay, now different citizens have different preferences about what combination they would they would prefer if they're gonna to have to pay. Some are willing to pay higher taxes in order to enjoy higher government services. Other, others would prefer lower taxes and lower government services. Next slide. Um, in a democracy, um, we make fiscal choices that reflect approximately the median preferences of citizens. I mean, you, you sort of can't have more taxes than uh, um, uh, you know, 51% of the voters will support. Um, and so um, not, uh, so you end up at a certain point with a certain level of taxes and uh, a certain level of government. Um, uh, and uh, that leaves you with private consumption of C1 and government services of G1. And we might note that most citizens are not totally satisfied with the outcome. Only the median citizen is absolutely, is, you know, exactly happy. Some citizens uh, are inevitably feel they're overtaxed and government is too big. Other people feel we are undertaxed and, and services are too small. Next slide. Now, what happens if, uh, if we acquire resource income? Um, uh, you know, sort of oil income that uh, we don't have to pay for out of uh, personal taxes. Well, that expands um, outward the potential combinations of private uh, consumption and government services to that orange line. Um, so there, there's, we can consume some higher combination of um, government services and private consumption. Next slide. Um, and so you can think that most people um, would would choose uh, you know, with, with higher potential for both, choose a little of each. And in this situation, I've illustrated the situation where um, the median preference is to, um, is to choose to fully eliminate taxes and you still end up with more government services and paying, and paying less. And you can see how that's a rational choice um, uh, and, uh, ra and uh, one potential sort of median choice even of, of uh, response to um, resource income, okay? Even though some people will, uh, again, most people will be dissatisfied and some people will think, well, we shouldn't have eliminated all our taxes and should have gone for more government services with that resource income. Next slide. <clears throat> now, if resource income expands some more, then we have the option of going from um, uh, not only not paying for taxes, but using that extra income um, for um, to further increase private consumption through distributions to citizens, such as dividends. And this illustrates a situation where um, not only are we no longer paying taxes, um, instead our, um, we can consume more than our original private income because of um, uh, paying dividends at the same time that we're getting even more government services. Next slide. Okay, so what are insights from this very simplistic model? The first thing is that your fiscal choices depend upon the circumstances. There's no right level of government as your, as your 
income level changes, and in particular, as you have resource income, um, you it's reasonable to uh, prefer a different level of government, a different level of taxes, and a different level of distributions to citizens. Um, and so um, as resource wealth changes, so do choices about government services, taxes, and payments to citizens. And finally, our preferences are not uniform. Um, and very few people are likely to be fully satisfied with our choices at any given time. And that's the way a democracy works. Next slide. Now I wanna take a look back at our fiscal circumstances and choices since statehood. Um, next slide. Now our fiscal history is pretty darned interesting, I think, and extremely relevant. But most of us, that is most of Alaskans, don't know or don't think about it very much. We have a relatively short time horizon, which for most Alaskans um, reflects the, uh, the period of adult, of their adult life that they've been here. Um, a few years or early half of the state that we sort of um, history is much more interesting and feels more relevant if you've lived through it um, but most of us have not been here long enough to experience most of our fiscal history um, and this is an underappreciated but i believe significant consequences of the high population turnover in alaska and finally long-term data on um, alaska's fiscal history are not easy to find or to understand um, the data i'm using are mostly um, data that thankfully was uh, collected by legislative finance to facilitate this kind of comparison. Next slide. Now to understand Alaska's fiscal history, it's crucial to keep in mind several major changes that have happened over the period of time that, that um, we've been a state, 60 years. Um, first, our population has grown enormously it's, um, it's uh, almost tripled, um, but we might note, and Neil Fried and others would point out the quite interesting change uh, that the population has leveled off and declined over the past five years. Next slide. Secondly, uh, for any fiscal comparison long-term, you absolutely have to take account of inflation and in particular, the very high inflation that occurred um, um, in the 70s and, and uh, early 80s. And so the, um, you know, a uh, uh, million dollars went a lot farther uh, 40 years ago than it does today. Um, and um, so in these comparisons that I've, um, I'm making, I'm adjusting all spending to reflect uh, the purchasing, revenues and spending to reflect purchasing power in real dollars or $2,020. Next slide. So um, if, you, if you combine the effects of rapid population growth um, and um, uh, dramatic inflation over the full time period, um, you get this converter from millions of current dollars to real per capita uh, $2,020. So what I'm interested in doing is if, I if we want to compare, say, how much does the state spend um, today compared to what it spent 40 years ago, I'm uh, converting everything to payments per resident of citizen, resident of the state in, uh, in today's purchasing power. Okay, and, um, and it, so the, this, is, uh, this is the conversion I have gone through. Next slide. Okay, now the starting point to understand in um, our fiscal history is um, the dramatic uh, and rapid and sudden and unexpected growth in oil production uh, in Alaska that occurred um, following the completion of the uh, Trans-Alaska Pipeline um, as uh, North Slope oil production came on. Earlier, we um, Cook Inlet was quite significant to um, the state's um, finances, but the North Slope vastly outweighed that. Um, and so one was thing to appreciate is how rapidly oil production expanded and then how dramatically it has since declined. Um, and um, 
uh, okay, next slide. Um, you, if you come, you have to also combine that um, uh, sort of those trends in Alaska oil production with the trends in the real price of crude oil. And so this is the um, average uh, West Coast price of, of uh, oil um, adjusted for inflation. And you can see that there were two major um, price booms, um, one in the uh, uh, 70s and early 80s and a second in the um, uh, late 2000s. Uh, and the um, one in the uh, late 70s and early 80s was especially fortuitous because basically the price of oil quadrupled at the very time uh, our huge amount of oil production uh, came on. Next slide. Now, all of that leads up to this slide, which shows our um, general fund oil revenues per Alaskan adjusted for inflation to $2,020. Um, and what we see is if we went back um, basically uh, before, um, uh, you know, but before the late 60s, we, uh, we had relatively low oil uh, revenues per capita expressed in today's dollars. Um, and then we that got a vast infusion of money in one year from the North Slope oil leases. Um, and then uh, while we then we went back to much lower oil revenues um, while we were waiting for that North Slope oil to come on. And then we uh, experienced an enormous boom in oil revenues from just basically a thousand dollars uh, per capita back in um, in today's dollars in FY75 to um, more than $18,000 uh, uh, per capita six years later. Um, so it's a huge uh, amount of oil revenue. And that lasted for just a few years and then it dramatically declined, although still even at its lowest, leaving us well above where we, where we were before the pipeline. Um, and then we had another boom in uh, oil revenues, uh, uh, but uh, it, it, which even though prices were higher, our production was so much slower that, lower that we, our oil revenues per capita and our population was higher. So our, um, the uh, sort of the per capita uh, real value was less. And then those drastically declined um, about six years ago, leaving us to where we are today. Next slide. Now, on this slide, I've added our non-oil revenues. And you can see how um, uh, our, uh, most of our revenues were non-oil revenues um, until the completion of the pipeline, with the major exception of the uh, revenues from the North Slope oil lease sales. Um, and uh, but after the pipeline came on, uh, very rapidly, uh, oil revenues uh, became the overwhelming share uh, of our of our unrestricted general fund revenues. And uh, not only that, but our non-oil revenues, in terms of their per capita real value, declined significantly. So. One consequence of, um, uh, you know, and, and now I'm going to start to generalize what, what trends do we see and what generalizations can we make from our history? And I'd say a first generalization is um, for a multitude of reasons, having high oil revenues has made us try less hard uh, to collect non oil revenues. Um, and um, so they didn't stay the same, rather they declined quite significantly. Next slide. Now, a major uh, factor in the decline in, in um, our um, non-oil general fund revenues was the elimination of the individual income tax, which had amounted in today, which had been collecting in um, today's dollars terms um, uh, at its peak, more than $1,000 per capita, um, but which we eliminated 
did. Um, you know, the last fiscal year collections are shown in, in 1980. Um, we did away with that and, and thus did away with about one third of our um, prior non-oil revenues. Um, and, and that means basically what we did was, a cent if you recall my very simple model, we made the choice to say, well, what are we going to do with all this money? Well, one thing we're going to do is um, uh, not give so much money to government, but keep more of it for ourselves by uh, paying fewer taxes. Next slide. Now, um, in this slide, I have added our spending. Again, um, keeping in mind uh, that uh, what all these figures are, are expressed on a per capita value expressed in real dollars. And there are two lines here uh, on the graph. The uh, lighter blue line at the top shows our total um, uh, general fund spending um, not including dividends, which I'll get to later. Um, and the um, lower line is the uh, per capita spending for government agencies. And what is the difference between those two lines? Well, it's mostly capital spending. Okay, so the difference between the two lines and what is, um, uh, is capital spending, which is not, not um, government agency, in the later years, it also includes um, some debt repayment and uh, retirement obligations and, and oil tax credits. Now, um, I think there is an awful lot, awful lot of history to be seen in this graph and an awful lot that those of us have been here, if you could remember, you can almost remember year by year, a political story that played out, newspaper headlines, decisions that were made, um, uh, uh, political debate and so on. But um, <clears throat> overall, we see um, certain general trends which seem to which say something about us and how we responded to oil well. So the first thing we see is that like um, uh, like my simple model uh, suggested we would, when we had more, when resource wealth gave us sort of more money, we spent more for government services, okay? And the higher our income rose, the higher our government services um, increased, um, and the higher our government spending increased. But it was not one-to-one. -one. There was a lag on the way up and there was a lag on the way down. It played out in reverse as our government as our, as our uh, oil revenues fell, our total spending declined. But there were lags with both of these, and it was, and our spending was not as volatile as our um, revenues. So, in general, um, our spending rose less rapidly. And in years where um, we, where our spending where our revenues exceeded, where those red bars exceeded the total spending line, those were years when we had net savings, okay? And um, in uh, years when our spending exceeded our, um, the revenue line, those were years when we drew down from our savings, okay? Um, and uh, what, that's, that's one thing and, um, in particular, we tended to, as revenues were rising, we tended to not save everything, or not spend everything, but but save some, whether deliberately or because we simply couldn't figure out a way to um, uh, spend it. Um, as as revenues fell, uh, we tended to not reduce our saving as fast and to and to run deficits. Secondly, or next, the um, the biggest, the most variable part of our spending was capital spending. And so if we had high revenues, we would use uh, a lot of it for um, big capital projects and big spending, and we would squeeze the capital budget, um, as we've done in recent years, when the revenues declined, that was the easiest to cut. And this meant that that our revenue booms were, were um, in effect became capital booms. Um, our, our government 
proxy spending was um, now if we if we go back and look at the late 60s we can see that um, what did we do after we had that huge infusion of oil uh, one-time oil revenues from the lease sales well our spending increased rapidly and we ran uh, in effect big deficits using up that money we had accumulated. And um, as people who wise people who were around at the at that time, I didn't, I was not here then. Um, people reflected on that experience and said, you know, this is a warning to us uh, that um, uh, money can go away pretty quickly uh, if you start spending a lot of it just because you got a lot of it. And that's what uh, played a large role in the uh, decision to create the permanent fund and save part of those revenues okay and that and so that's why the permanent fund dates from the years immediately following um our experience with our spending following the big um one-time uh revenues from uh the least big lease sale okay um another thing we observe is that um if we uh, fast forward to uh where we are now we see that um, our government spending, government agency spending, and indeed our total spending is almost as low as it's been um, since uh, on a per capita basis since the early 70s. Okay, um, since uh, we first uh, got any oil revenues at all. Uh, we've, we've squeezed it down. Um, and uh, of course, we've been uh, talking about and experiencing the stress of the budget cuts associated with this squeeze. And yet, um, and, and yet having squeezed it down to levels of um, 50 years ago on a per capita basis, we are still spending vastly more um, uh, than um, can be paid for by our um, traditional general fund uh, revenue sources. Um, uh, of uh, oil income and traditional non-oil income. Next slide. Um, and uh, so how did we do that? Well, I, you're all familiar with the story of um, we had saved large um, cash savings funds such as the CBRF um, uh, in, the, in the high uh, boom oil revenue years of, of the um, uh, late 2000s. Um, and then we rapidly depleted those and over the past uh, five or six years ran through almost $16 billion in those funds. Um, and so we, we, um, that's how we, that's how we went um, a number of years running multi-billion dollar deficits. We did not say, oh, we're, we need to uh, live within our resource revenue means uh, we said, we have these savings, we'll use them. Next slide. Okay. Um, now, uh, as you're all familiar, uh, the, the, this situation could not go on and, and everybody uh, sort of realized that, which led to the major um, legislative change in 2018 of um, SB 26, which um, said, okay, we're going to change the way we use permanent fund earnings. Permanent fund earnings are no longer exclusively um, uh, for dividends. Um, permanent fund earnings are um, uh, going to be uh, used for both uh, government and dividends. There will be a draw, uh, a POMV draw, um, equal to about 5% of the average value of the fund over the previous five years. And uh, that may be used for government or dividends, but it is not limited to dividends. Next slide. Um, and uh, let's briefly review the consequences of that for the permanent fund, which um, here we see not in per capita terms, in real terms, how dramatically it had grown. You know, you, you, you say, just like they tell you when you're starting out your working career, save a little every year and make some big deposits and in a few years when you get extra income and pretty soon you can have a hefty retirement portfolio and um what do you know um it works if you're a state too next slide now as um <clears throat> the permanent fund grew so did the permanent funds earnings 
um, not in any linear sense. They certainly bounced around, but nevertheless, the trend was upward. Next slide. Uh oh, are you able? Timmy, there. Yeah, okay. I'm here. Okay. Um, now, yeah. let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now we come to um, this slide. Uh, so. The green here um, indicates the effects of the permanent fund uh, transfer to the general fund as a result of SB 26. And you can see, and, and we're familiar, the permanent fund transfer exceed, significantly exceeds our oil revenues. It amounts to you know, about $3 billion a year. And so it's a huge boost to our general fund um, uh, and uh, if you look at that picture the way I've drawn it, you might say, well, a problem solved. Um, we um, uh, now have enough money to uh, cover the uh, spending at the level uh, we're, we're spending at. Um, uh, and that would be the case except for dividends. Next slide. Because any dividends that are paid um, also have to come out of that um, uh, uh, permanent fund transfer. And if we include those dividends, um, then we can see, and here I'm just showing the amount that's been appropriated um, uh, in, in the past three years for the dividend. We, at those amounts which are too low to make uh, a lot of Alaskans happy who think dividends should be bigger, Nevertheless, we are running a deficit of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and so um, the, uh, this, so the POMV transfer does not allow us to continue, uh, it does not make this picture sustainable. Next, next picture or next slide. Okay, now I want to also show another effect of the um, uh, of the POMV transfer. Under the previous formula, up through FY17, uh, basically under the previous uh, long time formula, um, basically about half of the earnings uh, were put in a, a account to be transferred from the permanent fund for the purpose of paying dividends, and the rest of the earnings were saved. Okay. They're either saved um, specifically as inflation proofing or, or simply saved as unspent earnings. Okay, and the, those unspent earnings are, um, are uh, pictured in blue, um, the, the savings in the permanent fund. But beginning in FY19, we, went, we saved a much smaller share of the earnings and most of the earnings were used for the POMV draw. And the consequence of this is that under the new, uh, with the new POMV draw, the permanent fund is not going to grow like it used to. Its growth will be driven primarily by um, uh, mandatory deposits um, uh, from um, a share of uh, oil royalties, as opposed to the significant growth that was driven by savings from past earnings. Next slide. Um, uh, now, as you know, even though we've drained our cash savings, we haven't run out of money which the legislature could spend. And we could draw more than a sustainable 5% from the permanent fund earnings reserve um, in the sense of uh, the cash is there. Is like, is there money we could spend? Yeah, there's cash, but that would be an unsustainable choice. And so we're having a lot of heartburn about that, those who don't think that we should make unsustainable choices. Next slide. Now this is the most complicated uh, slide and um, it, it would be inexcusable um, uh, even for those of us from Yale, but I think those of you from Harvard and Princeton are up to figuring it out. Um, and um, what I've done is I've tried to look at our um, spending and uh, uh, and revenue sources in a slightly different way. 
the previous slides that I showed you showed on a per capita inflation adjusted basis are so-called general fund um, revenues um, and our general fund spending. But I, I think from a fiscal accounting sense, if we really want to understand historically where we've been, we have to think of um, the permanent fund earnings uh, that we've been accruing as part of, in effect, our total income over this time. Um, and we have to think of our, our dividends as part of our total spending over this time. And so what I've done is I've uh, now expanded the green um, which is sort to add in as um, uh, the revenues we were achieving in every year as not just not just our oil revenues and our traditional non-oil revenues, but also the investment earnings the permanent fund was making. Um, and then I've added to our total spending the amount that we were spending for dividends to get that higher um, uh, brown line for the total spending, including dividends. Now, if you study that line very closely, I recommend several hours peering at it closely, you will begin to observe that um, for most of the time until uh, really about FY13 in most years, if you include our um, the permanent fund earnings, we were, our total spending including dividends was less than our total revenues and earnings. But because of the drastic decline in our oil revenues, um, that is no longer the case. And so we, um, uh, it, the, um, yeah, thank you. Where the pointer is, is illustrating the point where that is no longer is, uh, is, is the case. And we've been, um, our total spending has exceeded our combined oil revenues, traditional non-oil revenues, um, and, um, and permanent fund earnings. And so this is a, uh, this is sort of, a, a, I think, an alarm bell that we've hit a fundamental turning point in, um, in uh, where we are and the choices going forward. Gosh, I've uh, used up way kinds of time and I even had, I have not left any time for for brilliant reflections or questions. So I'm gonna maybe make a couple reflections and then turn it over for um, commentary. And I apologize, I, I, I um, we should have all brought our time turners. I hope you all understand that literary reference. Next slide. Next slide. Um, I want to, uh, I, I, you can read through these later. I'm going to go uh, on and, and point out just a couple reflections that I, I particularly want to mention. Um, so I'll, I, I'll skip most of these. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, let's um, back up one. Yeah. We're, we're facing a, a major debate about is it okay to spend unsustainably. I mean, we've been um, been having that debate for a number of years and now the crunch comes with um, the permanent fund as we debate that. And uh, the analogy is really, um, uh, there's a lot of analogies to this debate about how much should you leave for your kids. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it's not obvious. It's a complicated question, um, but I, I don't have time to talk about it. Let's go on. Um, I, let's talk about this. Um, for a long time now, we've been debating, you know, how much should we be saving? And um, the, it's not obvious if you have one-time resource wealth, how much you should save. Um, and, you know, at the extreme, you might say, well, if it's one time, you should save all of it and turn it into a, a permanent sustainable income stream by spending only the earnings. I mean, then you have a variation on that, which Scott Goldsmith um, uh, promoted for a number of years. You, you save enough so that all generations benefit equally. Um, and then you have our de facto choice that, well, you save at least some of it permanently, as we've done with the permanent fund. Um, and other related choices, save at least some for short-term contingencies 
or for certain dedicated purposes. But I'd say at the moment, the one I would argue for is all the rest is history. Um, um, and I'd say the rule I would say is we should at least maintain the value of what we've saved in the past. Ideally, we might wish to save more in the future, but we shouldn't run down what we've paid in the past. That's a topic for debate and discussion. Next question, or next slide. Next slide. Next, 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 <laughs> next, next, next. Okay, okay, let's back up to that one, yeah. Um, as I reflect on it, it seems to me, and if you think about my uh, little simplistic model, what happens if you go through all the adjustments on the upside as your resource income increases? Um, and then what can you do if your resource income declines? And I would say you can't necessarily play the movie backwards. As you move to a new place and you say, well, we're not going to pay taxes and we're going to have dividends um, and we're going to and we're used to certain levels of spending. Our fiscal preferences are affected by our past choices. We get used to that and we say we want more. We want to keep doing what we've been doing. But it's not only that we get used to it. We also attract and retain people who like those kinds of choices. So in effect, you create a place you, you attract and retain the kind of population that wants those kinds of choices um, and that will not necessarily go back to the kinds of choices you have made in the past. And in addition, your past fiscal choices create future obligations um, for O&M um, and um, expectations of government services on which people have actually come to depend. You know, um, you know, I moved here because there's a, a, a highway here or a marine highway here or a road here or a village airport here. Um, and I, I absolutely need it. And expectations about future tax obligations and government payments, like I get by because I don't have to pay taxes and I get a dividend, but I can't get by anymore without these things. So we can't necessarily play it backwards which makes it hard as the resource revenues decline. Next slide. Uncertainty makes the difficult choices we face harder. We face this constantly, this huge uncertainty about our oil revenues and our investment revenues. And it's always possible that things will turn out better than expected, that oil prices will go up, that will um, you know, make a killing on the stock market. Um, and so you can always, come up with an argument that, you know, it may not even be necessary to make this difficult choice. And then I would suggest that politically optimism tends to trump prudence. Um, and uh, the fact that it isn't certain that we're doomed keeps us from um, uh, facing up to the fact that we got to make change. Next slide. Next slide. Um, I think increasingly, um, both at the national level, state level and national level and international level, I'm, I'm reminded of the old adage that institutions matter. We tend to think about um, what's the right choice to make? What should we be doing? You know, what, how much should we be saving? How much should we be spending? Um, what kind of dividend should we have, uh, et cetera? But the really bigger question is, do are our institutions set up so that they will make good choices? Next slide. And so um, if we're concerned that we maybe haven't been making such good choices and we might not make very good choices going forward, we should be thinking more about whether our institutions are adequate to the times and the challenges we face. And so we should think about the most interesting example is um, people, a lot of people, including I saw Sharman, uh, I think was one on this call, thought that the way we conducted elections was not a working institution and we passed a rather significant change. But we should also think about how the leg legislature operates, how we educate Alaskans about fiscal issues, how we manage the permanent fund, and indeed, is the Constitution adequate to our current needs? Next slide. 
related to institutions is that leadership matters. Um, the only way we're going to get through these difficult choices is it, in, and be satisfied is with good leadership. And I've, I've been pondering ever since the fiscal, you know, the most recent fiscal crisis came, who's leading us? Where are our leaders coming from? Why don't we have more effect? Why don't, why aren't leaders coming forward who successfully advance my point of view? Um, uh, and, uh, but I think this is a question for the state and for the country. Um, where are our leaders coming from and how can we create and advance our future leaders? Next slide. Um, next slide. Uh, wealth is not always a good thing. Okay, um, uh, next slide, I, I wanna come, to, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a concerning thing that is more and more on my mind. The permanent fund is, given the challenges we face, is not necessarily permanent, not even the principal. And there are a lot of ways we can, if tempted, deplete the principal. Um, and uh, they're well known to us through inflation, through um, investing the principal in so-called needs like a, a gas pipeline that we need or, or uh, whatever else we need. Uh, borrowing backed by the fund, um, uh, failing to meet through regular uh, appropriations, court mandated constitutional obligations such as my retirement. I'll go and say, don't tell me you can't afford it. You've got money in the fund. And in the ultimate, the fund, uh, the constitution can always be uh, amended. And the fact is that unsustainable spending from the permanent fund could keep the fiscal party going for a long time still. And um, just sort of viewing the political challenges uh, going forward, with the fiscal choices we face, I worry that it will be tempting. Next slide. Um, next slide. Yeah, okay. So those were the slides I prepared. Um, I've left uh, almost no time uh, within our formal period for questions, but I'm glad to take any, um, as long as anybody wants to stick around and, and talk about these things. Sharman, I, I, I see lots of hands. Ha, ha, ha.